Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Today on The Microscopists, I'm joined by Beth Chimney from the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. And we discuss why harsh peer reviews leads to user-friendly software tools. Because we want tools to go out there in a state where someone can use them, where they're user-friendly. The difficulties of developing popular biology software tools in academia. So when I started um, in the lab, Cell Profiler did not actually have any dedicated funding at all. It was basically funded by running a contract image analysis fee-for-service thing and then hoping that that made enough money on the side that you could hire a software engineer to do cell profiler maintenance. And what makes people mad at scientists on Twitter? The most mad I've ever made someone on Twitter um, was I had made a giant thing of pasta sauce to make the lasagna and I had a very full pot of pasta sauce and someone was like, you don't deserve to run a lab if you keep food containers that full on the stove. <laughs> like what is wrong with you like why is that and it was like oh well you're a computationalist so that's why i guess we won't take your lab away or something like that and i was like a very strange reaction to someone posting a picture of food oh in this episode of the microscopists Hi, welcome to the Microscopists. I'm Peter O'Toole from University of York, and today I'm joined by Beth Simony from the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Beth, how are you today? I'm doing great, things. How are you? I'm really good, thank you. I, I, where to start? Actually, I'm going to start on a slightly different note, not personal, because uh, we mm -hmm. recently published, so this isn't a plug for my publication, in Nature <laughs> Communications, by the way. Okay, Beth, <laughs> Beth actually declared herself as one of the reviewers. Now, we weren't aware of that when it's being reviewed, but afterwards, I, I noticed Beth's thing on, on the publication. Beth, how, 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 why declare yourself to start with? Um, I think, so one of the reasons um, that I've done that, I, don't def I definitely don't do that on every paper. I've had some people who do it on every paper and they've reviewed my papers a few times and I see the same name over and over again. Um, part of the reason on, on this paper that I that I really wanted to declare myself was just um, I felt like I had asked you guys for a lot and I felt like you guys had done a lot and I wanted to sort of like show my admiration and sort of come out publicly that I thought that with all the improvements you guys have made to the paper that it was really amazing and that I wanted to sort of be on record as saying that you guys had put together something really cool. Well, that's that, that, so that's really kind. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so, so for the listeners, uh, publication reviewing as a someone who's pu publishing and you get the reviewers comments you look at them and you go oh i've got to do x <laughs> y z mm -hmm. uh, i've got to say i i think that we had three reviewers one was quite positive to start with and, and all slick mm -hmm. two others were quite critical so maybe one of yourself then mm -hmm. the paper is so much better mm -hmm. because of those criticisms and actually when i look back it wasn't ready it mm -hmm. really wasn't ready. We, we, I, I think we rushed it out. Or we didn't know we were rushing it out. It didn't feel like mm -hmm. we were rushing it out. But the feedback that came back and then the end result that's now out there, it's just so much better. Mm -hmm. And we're so much more confident that it can get used. It, it's mm -hmm. an app for analyzing data. That actually, I, I was hugely thankful of the reviewers. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's a difficult process to, to, to see it and then mm -hmm. come back and... And it's really nice that people do declare. I, I, there's been times when during the reviewing process, I wish people knew that it was me reviewing because actually you can just enter a mm -hmm. dialogue even mm -hmm. and address them and, and help. Uh, mm -hmm. Which viewers, in your case, were doing. You were helping mm -hmm. the board, uh, to as best data as we could in the PhD's time. So I would say it's not me yeah. or the Wiggins who, and, and Julie Wilson put loads into this far more mm -hmm. than uh, but uh, thank you, though. No, um, I mean, I get asked to, since we make a lot of tools, I get asked to review a lot of tool papers. And um, I think I I give those papers a really high bar because uh, one thing that um, Ann Carpenter, who I work really close with, and I, who used to be my boss for a long time, um, uh, say is um, hard on authors is kind to users um, because we want tools to go out there in a state where someone can use them, where they're user friendly. Because um, there's a lot of tools that people make something that works really great for them, 
Um, and it works really great for them and not a lot of other people and people try to use it. And there's so many hours spent in this ecosystem with people doing using trying to use tools that someone absolutely put their best effort in. But user friendly software design is really hard and it's not something that you're taught as a scientist, certainly of like, how do you make user friendly software? And so when I'm reviewing tool papers, what I see my role as is to, you know, make sure it's scientifically sound, which basically it always is, but to also make sure that for what the paper said, these are the people we want to use our tool, that it's sort of accessible to the people that they say are their stated audience. Um, and I think if we do that, then again, sort of all of science gets a little bit better. It's hard because you don't, you don't want to make somebody, you know, make something that has 20 years of polish with a software engineer before they publish it, but you do want to make sure that um, it's accessible to the people who want to use it. Ah, as was definitely not in that case at the start, because I think Laura would use three different uh, software codes because I think during the process of, and this is something actually to consider for anyone listening, mm -hmm. you know, each step, we, we, we had an end goal for the project, which was to analyze some data. But to analyze the data, we had segmentation, segmentation issues. We had the machine learning side. We had the uh, algorithm to, to the principal components analysis type outputs of it. Mm -hmm. And actually, there's three different programs that work better for each component. And... Essentially, we chose uh, not just me. You know, mm -hmm. Collectively, the easiest package to to solve each of those three points. But at the end of it, they were linked together. But it means you have to do one bit in one package, move to another, move to another, which is so un-user friendly. Mm -hmm. So the development of selfie in the end, thanks to the feedback, mm -hmm. gave enough push to make it better. And it's where mm -hmm. it needed to be to start with. So I, I think if we'd have, in hindsight we'd have designed it knowing we had to do all these steps but as, as a group that's never really done much in this area mm -hmm. we, we were we, we just bodged our way there and then you had to harmonize it all at the end and of course that bit is just, just you know mm -hmm. icing on top but it's hard mm -hmm. on the author kind to the user is exactly right yeah no and, and um you just you start with making the thing that works that's always you know whether you're designing for yourself or someone else you always start with just sort of getting something that functions and then it's just a question of how how much more work do you put in there and again it comes out to if you think you're the only person who's ever going to use this code like use the code that works for you but um if you think your code is sort of worthy of sharing or you think it will help other people then um, the likelihood that that will happen definitely goes up if you if you take the t take some extra time um, and get advice and feedback from naive users is often the best way to do it <laughs> um, and figure out how to get them to use it. Um, I will say we've fixed more bugs than Cell Profiler in response to having uh, just sort of gone and taught tutorials with our tools and then just seeing where people struggle. Um, and saying, all right, I've explained this to people five times in a tutorial. That means that we did something wrong in the software. It's something where we haven't set things up correctly to help people succeed. And so that's honestly where we fix a lot of our bugs. Well, I'm going to give a shout out to Grant Calder, who's our guinea pig in the end, once we got the app in a more polished, mm -hmm. he still found bugs, even with the soft, uh, even with the data mm -hmm. that loaded for sampling was anyway. Mm -hmm. that, that's, but thank you. And I think it's really cool for people to be brave enough to declare yourselves. I think most People, most authors are actually very grateful to reviewers. You know, mm -hmm. the, the criticism is seldom wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and if they are wrong, then they've misunderstood something. And there's, and there's a perspective change, which means the paper mm -hmm. is near enough to start with, arguably. Uh, and OK, there's always going to be the odd reviewer that is uh, somewhere out there. But yeah, it's not that often you encounter that reviewer, I don't think. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think if you assume that someone someone's heart is in the right place, and again, like mine is always just around sort of let's make these things user friendly and reviews hurt even when they're good good reviews. If they're like this isn't perfect, you're like no, this is my baby. I made this. <laughs> how how do you mean it's not perfect? But yeah, if if the process goes the way it's supposed to go, which it doesn't always, um, then what you end up with at the end is something better than where you started. <laughs> Yeah, no, so thank you very much, Beth. And we, we ought to, so actually, if you don't know Beth very well, I apologise because I haven't really introduced you fully. Uh, you, you are now really motoring in the, the way of cell profiler. Uh, mm -hmm. Lots of data analysis, the algorithms around data analysis, all the processing of data and images. Mm -hmm. But you weren't a computer scientist, were you, to start with? 
No, absolutely not. Um, my I, I'm a molecular biologist by training. Um, and in graduate school, I wanted to do a very fiddly project that revolved around um, co-localizing and measuring relative levels of a couple different proteins at hundreds of spots per cell times hundreds of cells. Um, and it turns out that's not trivial. Um, and I had I didn't know how to code. I'd taken a sort of two day MATLAB boot camp, and I asked around in my lab, and I asked my friends, and everyone's like, "Yeah, I got nothing for you." So Front. I'm going to need to learn to code. Um, and then I was introduced by uh, by Nico Sturman, who was then in Ron Bell's lab, to Cell Profiler, which uh, Ann Carpenter had put out a few years before the first version. I was like, oh, this thing's really amazing. Like, this is going to solve all my problems. And it, it did solve a lot of my problems. Um, but then at the end of it, I ended up with still a giant folder of spreadsheets with all of my measurements. And I was like, Oh no, I still don't know what to do. So I I took a nine week Python class and I learned to code. And I realized that um, working with Cell Profiler and helping people do analysis that was way easier than what I had done, which was a lot of counting things by hand and circling stuff by hand. I was like, this is great. I want to make this easier for everyone. So um, when a position opened up on the the Cell Profiler team with Ann Carpenter. Um, I was like, oh my gosh, this is a job helping people sell profiler. I've been doing this for free. I want to get paid to do this. Um, and from there, yeah, I've been at Broad about seven years. So I've got two questions. Mm -hmm. How much do you, do you ever get in the wet lab anymore? No, I don't. We don't have a wet lab. So uh, I haven't touched my pet in a very long time. Do, do, do you miss that side of it? I don't really miss most of the bench stuff, um, like cloning, tetraculture. Uh, I do miss doing microscopy. So um, I was lucky enough to just recently be down visiting the, the quantitative imaging course at Cold Spring Harbor and sort of looking at all of the microscopes that they had as the students were going through and doing it. I was like, oh man, those are really nice. And and even just in, in seven years, like some of the technology has come so far. Um, so if if we had a wet lab in our space, the Broad, I would probably be okay doing some microscopy, but the rest of it, um, I'm happier coding. That's fair enough. What was the first microscope you ever used? The first microscope I ever used was in undergrad. Um, there was a laser scan and confocal that I did for a lot of tissue section looking for um, IHC of a couple of molecules. Um, I mean, if you're not counting the little sort of plastic one yeah, that I got when I was yeah. four, um, which there's a whole movie of somewhere that I, I want to find someday. Um, but yeah, um, laser scanning confocal doing IHC 488-568. And I was just like, whoa, my data is beautiful. Um, and that was really the thing that drew me to microscopy at first is I was like, oh my gosh, it's data, but it's also really pretty. And if I'm going to be staring at this for however many hours a week, like at least it can be beautiful also. That's that's cool. So you went to mm -hmm. Anne Carpenter's lab and you, you sent a picture mm -hmm. of yourself and Anne here. Mm -hmm. Anne's a previous guest on, on Flow Stars itself because Anne herself is also a star. But it's amazing that now I mean, you've, you've spun out now mm -hmm. by yourself out of Anne's lab and now your own star. Mm -hmm. How does it feel to now be your own star, you know, out of mm -hmm. Anne's wings and actually being mm -hmm. with you? Um. I mean, Anne and I still work super closely together, and I'm incredibly grateful to her for giving me a chance in her lab in the first place, because I I had a very difficult grad school experience. I didn't publish. It was just not great. And she took a chance on me um, that a lot of other people wouldn't have taken. Um, and of course, the major tool that we're making, Cell Profiler, is not a tool that I made. It's a tool that she made. Um, but I'm so glad for her that she gets to focus on the thing that she has come to really love, which is all of this uh, morphological profiling, sort of downstream bioinformatics stuff. And I get to focus on the parts that I love, which are the sort of making tools that make people's science better and make people's lives easier. Um, and so um, it's really fantastic to sort of be doing that. It's still a little strange to me because I still I've been in sort of bioimage analysis as my main focus seven years now. And it still kind of feels like I'm new on the scene because there's some great people um, who've been doing this a lot longer than I have. But um, I'm really excited to be now more involved in the community and sort of helping out on projects like PLARREP and uh, the reboot of New Bias. And um, so all of that is really exciting. Uh, it's, it's, it's great. We'll come back to New Bias. So it's, it's, it's great that they are rebooted. Mm -hmm. or, or... Mm -hmm. I, I don't think they ever really faded away completely. It's just obviously mm -hmm. they're being dropped and they're, they're, they're now back, which is awesome. So we'll come back to New Bias uh, in a bit. Mm -hmm. So I, I always ask guests 
who their mm-hmm. inspirations have been. Mm-hmm. So, I'm going to ask you now, because you just see mm-hmm. it. I, I'm presuming Anne is one of your inspirations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, she sort of saw a need in the community. She went around and asked a lot of people and was like, this is a need, right? I'm not just crazy. And she, there were people were like, yeah, we don't have a thing that does uh, high content or sort of reproducible analysis without coding. And she she found someone who could help her make it and she made it. Um, and she's built, I should say, like an incredibly positive lab full of kind people and um, just sort of really good science. Um, Shantanu Singh, who's her co-PI now, between the two of them, they're the two nicest and smartest people that I know. Um, and it's rare that you find that combination, um, let alone when you find that combination in the two PIs of the lab. Um, definitely also my mom. Um, my mom is not a scientist at all. She was a librarian, but she taught me how to, that the most important thing to, in life is to, or in in doing your science, your professional life is to know how to find more information. And I think that's one thing that I try and teach folks in my lab or folks with who are trying to get started in image analysis is just sort of knowing where to find the information you need. Not everything needs to live in your head. There's so much stuff that I look up. And um, when new, new computational biologists who come from biology join my lab, they're always like, oh, but I have to Google everything. So I'm not really a, a software engineer or coder. I'm like, no, that's what we all do. Um, the most important thing is just learning how to find the information that you want to find. Um, and my mom really taught me that. And she's also, again, just sort of a great and really smart and really kind person. And that's who I try to be. So uh, do, you, do your parents realize how successful you are? And um, at the early stage of your career as well. Yeah, my, my mom's really excited. Um, unfortunately, my dad passed about 10 years ago. But um, yeah, everyone else, no one else in my family is a scientist. So they're just sort of like, okay, that's off doing her own sort of strange thing. It seems like she's really busy. So I guess it's going well. Um, but yeah, I think my mom would be really proud of me no matter what I was doing. That's, it's super cool. So I'm, I'm going to take you back then. When you were mm-hmm. 10 years of age, around that age, mm-hmm. 10, 12, around that mm-hmm. What did you see yourself doing? What was your um, dream career when you were a young child? I wanted to be either a singer or an actress. Um, I wanted to be famous. And then it turns out you have to be good at those things, which I'm not particularly. So when I got to about high school, the sort of realization of, oh, like, I'm not actually good at singing or acting. I love those things, but I'm not good at them. Um, I did, you know, choir and acting lessons and all of that stuff. and. I'm just not very good at it. So I was like, okay, what what do I also love but am good at? And I took an AP bio class in high school and was like, oh, wow, this is really cool. This is all really fascinating. So I decided to go into biology. And um, from there, again, never saw myself as a computational person, never took a sort of college computer science class or anything. But as I got into, you know, using code and using computer science, I was like, oh, I love this and I'm really good at it. And so I'm just going to, I think, keep chasing the, you know, ooh, that's cool. Um, as long as that keeps working as a career choice. I, I think that's really sound advice, actually. Follow what you enjoy and follow what you're good at. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> obviously you enjoyed acting and singing, mm-hmm. but maybe maybe not good at it. Obviously, I haven't mm-hmm. heard you sing. Uh, are you going to Elmi or anything this year? Maybe we can get you singing at that point. Uh, yeah, I, I will be at Elmi. Uh, the last Elmi I was at in Dublin in 2018, I believe there was karaoke after. So um, <clears throat> I did some karaoke at SLAS this year, which was my first time since COVID. So that was really fun. That's got to be good to have you. I, I, so I, I mean, I know we met before Dublin, mm-hmm. I think, but I, I certainly remember sitting. It was at the, uh, it was, a, it was a barbecue, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, outside on the on the wooden benches, I remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, talking to you and stuff and, and actually going back to my PhD student who were then teaching on a course at Heidelberg mm-hmm. EMBL that Laura went on and you gave a load of really helpful advice mm-hmm. I think Laura's been in touch with you once or twice since by email mm-hmm. asking questions uh yeah I, I just so much influence <laughs> you know I, I I hope you appreciate you know that you're appreciated uh and That's really nice to hear. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I love helping people. I love that moment when, again, sort of you help someone and they realize that there's this whole thing that they could do before that they they couldn't do now. I've, I've loved, I did teaching in sort of high school and college as sort of like side jobs for, you know, for coffee money and stuff like that. But um, with bioimage analysis, we have this sort of huge gap between people who really want to do 
um, these analyses and really want to find things in their data and the tools just are the best that we can make them with the time and money that we have and the technology that exists. But there, there is a, a gap for a lot of people in terms of like, here, here's what I need and then here's what exists and helping people over that gap and helping them get to the other side is just incredibly rewarding. So thinking of that side, how, how are, how, how is the work funded and how easy is it to get funding? So I can't imagine it's the easiest area. So it's not solving a straight biological question. It's not, mm -hmm. You know, designing a whole new technology, it kind of sits almost in limbo land when it comes to this. So where, how do you find getting funding and different initiatives? Yeah. So when I started um, in the lab, Cell Profiler did not actually have any dedicated funding at all. It was basically funded by running a contract image analysis fee for service thing and then hoping that that made enough money on the side that you could hire a software engineer to do cell profiler maintenance. Um, in oh gosh it was 2018 now um when chan zuckerberg first got going and started bringing uh giving out grants one of the first rounds of grants they gave out were these imaging software fellows because it's there's a lot of grants out there for making a new piece of software there are very few things out there for taking a piece of software that thousands of people depend on and use and keeping it working um because it's not it's not flashy and grant organizations want to have flashy things for the most part. Um, and I give Chan Zuckerberg a lot of credit that one of the very first things they did is fund image trace, psych and image and cell profiler, a software engineer each to maintain stuff and keep working. Um, a lot of the rest of our lab's funding comes from uh, this thing we call Center for Open Bioimage Analysis, which is a joint um, grant between myself and Anne and Kevin Elisari at University of Wisconsin. Um, which is an NIH grant where they have they have this mechanism that's about sort of taking technology and bringing it to other people and making it easier to use. And so we do um, tech development, we make new tools. Um, we have a new tool called Piximi that um, I'm going to be showing at Elmi and um, that has been out for a while, but we keep adding more functionality and is a really easy way to use deep learning without needing to learn to code, um, which we're very excited about. Um, but we do it in the con not in sort of vacuum, but we do it with biological partners that we identify who have really difficult to solve biomage analysis problems. And the other thing that that grant funds is community engagement work. So it funds us to be able to go out and do tutorials or write protocol papers and things like that, because there's a lot of problems that can be solved now with the right knowledge. Um, but we need to get the knowledge out there and we need to get it to the people who need to read it. There's a lot of stuff that's trapped in computer computer vision journals, but that's not what biologists read. So if you if Anne had commercialized cell mm -hmm. profiler, would that have enabled it to be developed develop faster or do you think it would have hindered its uptake? Um, I mean, there's a lot of models for commercialization. We do still sell a, a sort of service plan for cell profiler that if you want sort of X number of hours of help, um, and we still do image analysis fee for service and that does help a little bit. Um, I, th I think it would have helped cell profiler get sort of slicker faster, but um, if you look at the, the license of a lot of these commercial pieces of software, it's beyond what an individual lab can afford. And certainly, you know, even at, beyond an individual lab, a grad student who's trying to get started and wants to sort of push their lab from, you know, representative image shown to, all right, let's let's start analyzing this quantitatively. They're not going to convince their PI to shell out thousands of dollars just up front. <laughs> um, and so I think having it be free helps the adoption doesn't necessarily help with the sort of um, being able to pay to keep it used, but we're lucky that we've found some groups over the years that think it's valuable, and okay. we're going to just keep trying to figure out how to do that. So, so have have you ever gone to the, like the, the the big pharmaceuticals, like to Pfizer, GSK, uh, and so forth, and asked them mm -hmm. for sponsorship for for supporting it because they use it, mm -hmm. they use it in a big way. Mm -hmm. So, do do, so, they, do they do they do they help? So some of them buy the buy the service plans, um, but um, I, I can say we don't sell tons of those. Um, yeah, it's I mean, it's hard when someone's like, I could have this thing for free or I could give you ten thousand so dollars. It's like, well, but I could have it for free. It's hard. It's hard for and the people who who work at the pharma companies have to then justify to their bosses like, OK, he, I, here's why I think putting, you know, X thousand dollars into cell profiler is worth our time. Um, it's one of those things that if everybody did it, um, you know, it would be great for things, but each individual company doing it isn't going to see a lot of one-off value. So um, 
it's it's hard in that sense. Yeah, no, I, I can see that. I, I do wonder if if there was a specific new development that wanted and it's going to certainly help pharma. Mm -hmm. I can easily imagine you could approach three, four big farmers mm -hmm. and just say, look, this is what we want to develop. It's in your mm -hmm. interest. You get free access. Mm -hmm. Give us 50,000 mm -hmm. each to sponsor that program. And mm -hmm. yeah, I bet it could be done. But anyway. Yeah, I will say not a pharma, but the Allen Institute really sponsored cell profilers move to 3D because they wanted it for their stuff. And they were like, OK, we see that there's this tool. We want to not just build stuff internally, but help it bring it to everyone. Um, but that's a pretty one off case for as long as I've been on on the project uh, formally, which is seven years. Right. And it, it, you know, asking the companies is hard work. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Again, then you have to have almost a project manager to, to go out selling Mm -hmm. and everything else it, it, oh, it's a complicated world isn't it mm -hmm. you touched on the machine learning side uh, mm -hmm. the ai and obviously you've got a lot of the chat programs now coming through that can mm -hmm. you know, design for coding to start with mm -hmm. Do you, are you starting to use that to start to write some of the scripts and then edit them and correct them or are you ignoring mm -hmm. them or are they a threat even they're definitely not a threat. I mean, I think if if everyone knew how to code, that would be fantastic. Um, you know, certainly we would pivot to doing different stuff because what we do is sort of bring code to people who don't know how to code. Um, but I think it would be amazing if more people wanted to and more people did it. Um, I don't personally, I don't personally get to do that much coding these days. Um, it's a lot of paper writing and things like that. Um, so I haven't used it much, and I'm not that inclined to use it myself personally because. Um, I know what kind of mistakes I'm prone to make and therefore where to find them and fix them when stuff goes wrong. I don't know as well yet when, uh, you know, the problem with all of these large language models is they write everything very confidently um, and sometimes they're confidently wrong. Um, and I know how to trace down my own mistakes. I've been doing that for a long time. I don't know as well yet how the kinds of mistakes it makes. But people in our lab have been using it and have said that it's one of those things that 75% of the time it works really well. And then 25% of the time you then spend two hours trying to chase down like where is the weird bug it introduced. So um, probably as these things get better um, in the long run, it will, um, you know, it will be faster than writing your own code. But I'm I'm not fully on fully on board myself yet. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I, I will say uh, Loic Royer put out yesterday this thing called Omega that's supposedly a bioimage analysis scripting thing that self-corrects errors. And so if stuff like that becomes more common, that's going to be really cool. Only if it knows it's made an error. I, you know, um, and, and I'm, I'm going to say to your lab members, they, if they're getting it 75% there, at least they're asking it to do the right thing, which is also yeah. a skill in itself. Mm -hmm. So, so I, yeah. it, it, that, that in itself is not trivial to get that close. Mm -hmm. You mentioned your lab. You sent me some pictures. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is a picture of your lab on a night outside, mm -hmm. I presume. So how, mm -hmm. many, how many are in your team currently? Uh, at today, we have six. We fluctuate between sort of six and ten. We have a new postdoc who's starting in about a week and a half. Um, and uh, one will be leaving in June and one starting in July. Um, yeah, uh, we, we have a couple software engineers. We have one staff scientist who does a lot of our high content screening stuff. And the other folks are in my group. We have we have a visiting uh, grad student for the year who's been fantastic. And we're going to miss her terribly when she leaves in June. Um, but the postdocs in my lab are part of this postdoctoral training program that we started in 2019, which we call the postdoctoral training program in bioimage analysis. As far as we know, it's the only one. But um, it's modeled very heavily on Jennifer Waters' um, microscopy fellows program. Um, where we take folks who have the same journey essentially that Ann and I have, where they're molecular biologists, cell biologists, you know, wet lab biologists who know a bit about uh, image analysis and a lot about imaging and want to learn more. And help we help them sort of become full-time computational biologists by coming to the lab for two or three years and working on projects. And um, I should say, yeah, so we've, we've had um, eight people start. We have three more people sort of in the pipeline and we've had six people leave and it's been really successful and also really rewarding to see people come in and develop these skills and then go off and get really cool jobs where they're paid a lot of money. <laughs> oh, well, so that's it. I've just noticed with this picture, it makes it look like I've got a candle sticking out the top of my head. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, this mm -hmm. means I'm one and trust me, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot older than one years of age. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, so the, the funding, who funds those, those fellowships? 
Um, so some of that's funded by the by the center. Um, some of that's funded by the the contract image analysis work. Um, and it's great because you know we we do have a staff scientist who does you know image analysis fee for service projects for us. But you know she's seen everything at this point many times. But um, the variety of projects we get in for that are great because it allows the postdocs for them all of these projects are theirs for the first time and they get to learn things as they're trying to solve them. Um, and so I don't know that we'd be able to do what we're doing as well as we could if we didn't also have this commercial side where we sort of take in projects and just sort of do small 10 to 20 hour um, image analysis tasks that then we give back to the collaborators. So um, it's a weird sort of hybrid funding model where some of it's, you know, some of it's grant funded and some of it's just um, core facility funded. It, which comes back again to, <clears throat> I, I think the whole community uh, mm -hmm. And I don't I actually it probably matters very little what area of science you're in. Mm -hmm. uh, the importance of software for analysis of data is huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet still in the funding bodies, in mm -hmm. general, quite hard to get funding mm -hmm. to do token bits, yes. Mm -hmm. Projects, a lot harder still. It's still mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's the funders mm -hmm. or whether it's the the panel that meets to discuss it that aren't so mm -hmm. into analysis and can't quite see the wider benefit straight away uh, mm -hmm. until it's developed. I mean, Image J was mm -hmm. you know, really struggled. And now not only scientists use it, but home photographers, mm -hmm. use, you know, and, and it's had a huge impact. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't think that was funded properly in the first instance. Yeah, I don't know too much about the original when Wayne wrote NIH image and stuff. I I, I have the uh, the impression that you're right that there have definitely been struggles I mean, for mm -hmm. over the sort of forty something years that it's been around. Um, but yeah, it's I one of the first slides I always put up when I give a talk is a picture a drawing by Ramoni Cajal. Um, first of all, because it's beautiful, but second of all, because um, I think in microscopy particularly, we are hindered by the fact that most of our history is as a qualitative technique. Um, and so I think, you know, stuff like genome sequencing, when it came out, people were immediately like, okay, well, we definitely need computers for this because it immediately came with sort of computers right alongside. Whereas we used microscopes for hundreds of years without any computers and we got along okay. Um, so I think, uh, I think we're hampered a little bit by that history. Um, and it's something that is is slowly changing. You know, the, the sort of beachheads are softening, but um, you know, we've got a lot, we've got 400 years of history to sort of make up for. Yeah. Well, obviously we've done our app side of it, so we mm -hmm. get it. Uh, but it is amazing if you go back, you know, you say it's been around for centuries and you go back to Robert Hooke's pictures and mm -hmm. the beautifully drawn pictures of a single mm -hmm. set, not of three or five of them, just look at mm -hmm. what's different. Mm -hmm. you no, know, and biology, we looked down microscopes and you looked at a cell, and many mm -hmm. people will look at a cell, uh, mm -hmm. and not the hundreds of cells, to mm -hmm. embrace the heterogeneity and mm -hmm. identify the subtle differences and why those subtle differences exist and mm -hmm. what some profiler is, is out there to do uh, and to mm -hmm. embrace and to enable us to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we've talked about funding, we've talked about getting funding, setting mm -hmm. up. How was it actually when you broke away from that? I, I know you still work really closely with Anne, so mm -hmm. it, it wasn't really, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't almost, I don't, I could be wrong, mm -hmm. probably wasn't the same way you had to start in a new institute to set up a group, but you were still, mm -hmm. now you've got your own group and have to set mm -hmm. it up. How daunting was that? Um, when Anne first approached me about, I think we should do this, and she's written a whole article in eLife about like why her decisions around doing it and things like that, I was just sort of like, I don't really know. I was not immediately on board with this idea. Um, and it it was more of a transition than I thought it would be. So, I mean, essentially, you know, pre-split, the lab had sort of three teams. It had the bioinformatic team, what we call the image-based profiling team, um, the image analysis team, and the engineering team. And I was already running the image analysis team. Yeah, I should just say, just for clarity, this wasn't a split between you and Anne. This was Anne. No, Watson yeah. Divide up her lab to make it more manageable or, and to be mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. 
And she was like, so I want you to keep running the image analysis team, but as your own lab, and then also we'll fold the engineers in with you. And so it was really in at the time only a headcount increase of like two people. Um, and I was already supervising like four people. So I was like, how how much harder can it be? And it's a lot harder. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, just I think even if the day to day isn't harder, just the um, the knowing that these people are going to rely on you, that that their salaries are going to get paid, that you're going to steer them in the right direction, that you're going to help them get the tools to where they need to be, and also them as people where they need to be. Um, the you know I take that responsibility very seriously because um, I've I've had great mentors and I've had eh, mentors, um, and I want to be more like the great mentors that I've had, and I want to help people sort of reach their potential. So, try to tune that, and it's been. A whirlwind. It's only seven years you've been there. Now you've got your own. Mm -hmm. This is whirlwind fast. Mm -hmm. How do you relax? <laughs> How do you relax? <laughs> I'm I figure yeah. it out. Um, yeah. Um, I I have I have a wonderful husband who I love spending time with. Um, uh, we we go to some Red Sox games each year. Um, I do some gardening at home. Um, hey, you sent me uh, a picture of your. Is this mm -hmm. this isn't your garden? This is just a garden box, surely. Yeah. So yeah, this is a garden box. This was the the first year that I was like, okay, I'm gonna get a thing and actually gonna grow some vegetables. So there's some some on spring onions there and some carrots, and the carrots didn't come out that well. Some potatoes in the back, and um, yeah, I mean, it's certainly not enough food to live on, but just sort of in terms of like, oh, hey, I made this. I love to cook, so being able to sort of take it one step further and be like, I not only like put the food together, but um, I made the food. this picture of a, a lasagna. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I swear that cheese needs more cooking on the top. Yeah, it did need a bit, but um, it was uh, it was something I was my my sister had COVID and I was giving it to my mom to bring to my sister and she needed to get going. But uh, I was part of the that picture also was funny because was um, the most mad I've ever made someone on Twitter um, was I had made a giant thing of pasta sauce to make the lasagna and I had a very full pot of pasta sauce and someone was like you don't deserve to run a lab if you keep food containers that full on the stove I'm like, <laughs> what is like what is wrong with you like why is that and it was like oh well you're a computationalist so that's why i guess we won't take your lab away or something like that and i was like a very strange reaction to someone posting a picture of food <laughs> was, she, was that person serious I don't know. <laughs> I, don't take it. I think so. <laughs> I always try and see the positive. I'd take it as tongue in cheek humor, but but no, I, I know some people are actually. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but I will say, I can't believe I've criticized your cooking, but if it wasn't cooked, you're going to make your system even sicker than COVID. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> no, the lasagna was cooked. It was just the, the cheese needed a little more browning. But... Oh, I'm I know. So, uh, <laughs> what is your signature dish if you cook at home? Um, the first thing I ever learned to do was sort of uh, pasta in uh, pasta with seafood, usually like shrimp or scallops with um, sort of butter and garlic and white wine, because it's really simple, but it basically you can't screw it up just about. It's it's really nice. Um, I do love cooking Italian. Unfortunately, my husband doesn't really like Italian. We end up cooking a lot more um, Asian and Mexican and sort of global flavors. Um, just because in Massachusetts, we don't get as many of those. There's a lot of pizza and, you know, not a whole lot of other global flavors in Massachusetts. I, I, I'm, I'm still taken aback that someone doesn't like Italian cooking. That's amazing. You apparently grew up with a lot of bad Italian cooking. So uh, there's apparently some some stuff related to that. <laughs> I he, he, he may still get there. Come on, yeah. just eat pizzas. Surely you eat mm -hmm. pizzas. Oh, yeah. Pizza, yes. But sort of tomato sauce is, is you know, kind of hit or miss with him. Oh, wow. Actually, no, my, my son hated our pasta sauce for a long, long time. Now mm -hmm. he's growing into it. <laughs> growing mm -hmm. back into it. Now he's in his 20s. Now, either that or he's a lot more polite and eats it for us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure which. <laughs> so also outside of work, you sent me some other pictures, actually. You sent me a picture of Boston Red Sox. Yeah, so this was a blanket that I actually made. Um, that's one of the other, I, I don't sit still well at all. And so um, I picked up knitting in graduate school from a dear friend because I was like, oh, then at least when I keep my, my my hands are fidgeting, it does something useful. So yeah, that's like a full size uh, blanket with, uh, with a Red Sox logo on it. I made my husband, a, he's from San Francisco originally, a San Francisco Giants one that matches that. <laughs> 
how big roughly are these? Um, six feet by like three feet. I knew you were going to give me that in imperial measurements and not metric. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Two meters by one meter. We'll go metric. Yeah. You're a scientist. It's meant to be metric now. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I can do the, like, when folks, when, you know, non-US folks in lab are talking about weather and stuff, I'm usually the one who's, like, when everyone else is, like, 70 degrees, I'm, like, 20C. <laughs> um, I can do the conversion. It just doesn't immediately pop to mind. Oh, God, could you please just, just do a special American version of sound profile, where we get a scale bar, it's a fraction of an inch. <laughs> <laughs> that drive everyone nuts. That'd be quite entertaining, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, coming back on to work. Uh, and beyond cell profiler, we, we mentioned mm -hmm. bias earlier. Mm -hmm. so new bias. Tell me a bit about it for those who don't know what new bias is. Yeah. So new bias stands for Network of European Union Bioimage Analysts. Well, um, and the American. original what? In the US. So, yes. so this is the network of European mm -hmm. and your. Mm -hmm. So it was funded, the original version of it started 2015, 2016, give or take, um, and was funded by a European Union cost grant mechanism. Um, so it was originally designed for the EU, but they could have a couple of members in other countries as well. So it was like, for they could have other countries join, they could have two members each. And so the Carpenter Lab was one of the two US official affiliates of New Bias. Um, and the goal was just, you know, we have these bioimage analysts, these people who specialize in doing analysis, they tend to be one person in like a biology lab, or one person sitting in a core alongside also teaching about microscopes and where the information exists, but it's really scattered. Can we actually bring these people together to learn from each other to teach other people to sort of become a group as opposed to a lot of individuals. And it did a fantastic job at that. It really sort of brought, I think, biomage analysis as a field together. Um, and then the grant ended in 2020 at the same time COVID hit. And, you know, folks still did some great stuff. Like um, they set up an F1000 gateway. They, um, they did New Bias Academy video tutorials when everyone was stuck inside with their data. Um, but without funding, it's hard to have a scientific society sort of like come together. And so, um, starting this year czi has given us a grant to sort of reboot it we're probably also rebranding from new bias to so bias um society of bioimage analysts because our goal is not for it to be just in the eu anymore because of the original grant mechanism it had to start there but our goal is to make it global because we absolutely know that um people are trying to solve these image analysis problems everywhere where people are using microscopes, which is everywhere. Um, so our goal is to make bioimage analysis, bring bioimage analysts together for their career stuff to help make more educational material and sort of training stuff so we're not all writing the same five tutorials over and over again, but actually sort of sharing stuff. Um, and then just sort of being recognized as a community and as a job path, um, you know, bioimage analyst is still a very weird job for, for most, even scientists, but um, we're getting there. Yeah, and difficult career paths. Mm -hmm. I, you know, yourself, Anne, are some of the few exceptions that can make a, make a proper academic career out of it. Uh, and I've only been at it a couple of years. I don't know if I get if I make the list yet, but uh, we'll see I, if I succeed. But you have your own group, and it's all mm -hmm. around data analysis. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of people, as you say, individuals in core facilities or in individual labs. Mm -hmm. They're not leading the labs, mm -hmm. uh, and it's because of that funding model. It's so hard to develop a, that that ethos. And you bias, and what was the new term for it? So bias, probably. So bias. So, so. We're, we still haven't decided so on the bias, isn't it? So mm -hmm. biased. You need to think that name through carefully. New bias, yes. So biased. I was just so biased. You know, mm -hmm. he's going to come out wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. But at least that creates a network that, mm -hmm. that enables that. But it'd be great to see those individual spots become mm -hmm. groups and, and have more of them and networked. Really, mm -hmm. it is one of the most networked communities. Mm -hmm. Probably scientifically, it's one of the most network groupings because it is so international and mm -hmm. always works together. You mentioned Chan Zuckerberg, uh, mm -hmm. the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, uh, a couple of times. How mm -hmm. many PZI projects are you involved with? Um, four at the moment. Oh. <laughs> um, so they fund a cell profile software engineer. Um, I am one of their imaging scientists. Yeah. Um, so um, I've I've been funded by them for a couple of years now, and hopefully a couple more. <laughs> um, 
uh, I'm on this this grant for so bias and also um, a grant that also started earlier this year uh, head, headed by Anna Jost over at Jennifer Waters' group at HMS to make uh, online uh, video courses for microscopy and image analysis. Because as I've alluded to a bunch of times <laughs> so far in this call, I love teaching, I love education, I love helping people sort of find the knowledge that's already out there, but get it to them specifically. And so I'm super excited to be involved in that group too. Uh, that was three, wasn't there a fourth? Nope, super fast software engineer, me, my personal salary, yep. and then, yeah, the, <laughs> those two new uh, advancing collaborative imaging projects uh, grants. <laughs> so, so there's so all based around the image analysis mm -hmm. of light microscopy images. Mm -hmm. What about the electron microscopy side? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't done much with that just because in general, other people are doing it really well. Um, and our goal is not to sort of butt in where other people are doing things really well. Our goal is to sort of add value in places where we feel like we add value. We're super happy to collaborate with those folks and to sort of learn from them. And I think as deep learning becomes more popular, a lot of the tools will become less specific to what the image exactly looks like. Um, but it's it's simply just something other people do better. And I, so I'll, I'll give another shout out to Jan Zuckerberg again. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, do you know what? I, I need I need I need to eat podcast. Yeah, <laughs> Mark, that would be cool. Find out their yeah. motivation because <laughs> the meetings. Oh, we've just come off the back of a meeting, uh, season mm -hmm. I meeting, and they have brought together the light mm -hmm. microscopy image analysts, the electron mm -hmm. microscopy communities, and image analysts. So they are talking. They're there talking at the same meeting. They're talking together. They're sharing ideas. You've got those mm -hmm. breakout rooms where different ideas can be hit back mm -hmm. and forth their problems can be raised and possible yeah. solutions from different sides of the community i think it's before that those communities would have been far more separated mm -hmm. and they are creating a genuine interface mm -hmm. uh, i think you know it's one thing funding individuals mm -hmm. i think something that is a bit different is they're bringing those individuals together and those groups mm -hmm. together so they can share across it. And I think actually that's sometimes they're very different. So you think, good grief, these people are never going to talk. Mm -hmm. but because there's such a variety, it's sliding, sliding box. Mm -hmm. and everyone's super cool. Yeah. So. It's, it's one of the friendliest. And again, sort of the idea of somebody else is doing this better. Let me just point them at that direction. I mean, there's enough work to go around. So, but rather than people trying to compete and one person trying to say, I am the king or the queen of image analysis and all of you are below me. Like everyone just is sort of like, yeah, let's work together. Um, which I love about this community. I'm yeah, I'm super excited that EM folks are getting bring brought more in. I'm excited about this um communist initiative about bringing in more of the medical imaging stuff too, because it's crazy how much sort of EM light microscopy and medical imaging all are solving very similar problems and don't talk to each other. Um, it's kind of wild. And so I'm super excited to see people sort of trying to bring these groups closer together and sort of stop trying to resolve the same problems over and over again in different fields. Yeah, and that's almost where you need international funding. And, and they partly do fund international. We need even bigger. Maybe that's where they dovetail into Bill and Melinda mm -hmm. Gates. And mm -hmm. stuff like that. Uh, you said you love training. And mm -hmm. so this is mm -hmm. one of the training courses that you are. Yeah, so this is the training program that I mentioned where, um, yeah, I've got my my awesome folks. We've got, uh, like I said, three more starting. And um, I particularly give shout outs to um, Nassim Jamali and David Sterling, who were the first two who sort of took a chance on this entirely unproven model of can we, you know, we knew that we had had some people come through the lab and sort of, you know, start off as co as biologists, sort of uh, computational biologists, big B, and then go back to sort of like balanced C and B. Um, but they were, we started this new training program and they were just like, cool, sign me up. Um, and they both did amazingly well and learned a ton and are now sort of impacting things, um, elsewhere. And, um, it's been absolutely my favorite part of the last five years has been having those people come through my lab and sort of start their scientific careers and push them in new directions and then, you know, get offered really great jobs that they're really excited about at the end of it. And you mentioned how some of them go off to I, I mm -hmm. presume it's to industry as well in some cases, because you mentioned they're getting paid very nicely or mm -hmm. sort of handsome mm -hmm. going through to industry. Do you feel that the amount industry pay, especially computer scientists that can go into 
uh, and yeah, not just into science, but can go into uh, banking industries, mm -hmm. market industries, and so forth. And they they pay mega bucks. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as a prohibitive of attracting the best talent into the scientific image analysis community? Um. It certainly makes it harder, you know, when you know that a that a good software engineer could sort of walk across the street, and in our case, it's literally across the street to Google and um, and go make twice as much money. Um, um, I think for a lot of the problems we're trying to solve, um, having a lot of domain expertise helps for many of the things, which is why, again, we pull from biologists um, and then sort of give them the computational skills, because there's a lot of stuff that is a different between how microscopy works in theory and then how microscopy actually works when your secondary antibody you know the the fluorophore dissociated from the antibody and now you've got speckles everywhere or you know all the gajillion things that your fixation you know didn't quite work there's a gajillion things that can go wrong um in your sample on the way to the to the detector and so um having that domain expertise helps but um we've been fortunate that we've had a couple of fantastic several fantastic software engineers in the group during my time um but yeah absolutely it's a little bit hard sometimes to understand why they want to work with us when they could go across the street and make a lot more money but i think some of it's for the love of making the world better and making making something that they know is going to get used and is going to improve sort of all of science i, I remember talking to i think it's pearl and rider pearl and rider and mark bray and i can't remember which went on wanted to do a medical <laughs> MD because you know they wanted to help people and MD wasn't for them as it turned out mm -hmm. and they turned to mm -hmm. back into to research because there they can have a more profound effect mm -hmm. you, you, you can't diagnose properly mm -hmm. without scientific tools uh, and analyze mm -hmm. and actually what you're doing for the drug de development but also I think for later on personalized medicine sound profile is going to be behind a lot of the mm -hmm. emergency uh, emergence through that side mm -hmm. i'm going to ask you another question now i asked you what you wanted to be when you were 10 you wanted to be an actor a singer you are now a very committed uh mm -hmm. scientist i don't know what the right term is data yeah. analyst bioanalyst bio mm -hmm. uh if you could do any other job though for a day mm -hmm. a week a month what type of job would you like to sample what sort of environments, what sort of job would you like to get a taste for? Not to not full time, but just go and try. That's a really good question. Um, again, I, I, I love sort of feeling like I have an impact. So, um, you know, government would be something where, you know, if I felt like I could do a lot of good there. Unfortunately, from the outside, it looks like a lot of government. I would I would probably not like the bureaucracy and the playing by the rules and I, I don't like playing by rules if i don't understand why they exist so i don't think i do well there but it would be really interesting to get a better sense of what could we do to make a lot of things around us better and why aren't we doing it already <laughs> so you'd like to go to the political infrastructure and mm -hmm. try and try and enable something that's a cool answer i've got some mm -hmm. quick fire questions for you yeah you do must know this is coming mm -hmm. what's your favorite color blue yeah so dappy dappy, dappy. Yeah. yeah okay i mean dappy or hooks you know either one yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. uh are you an early bird or night owl uh left to my own devices i am a night owl and so whenever you know vacations and stuff i go that way but early bird is you know i have a couple hours where i can get work done before meetings start so i've become an early bird by necessity are you an early bird and night owl do you burn it both sides i try not to <laughs> i do my very best not to uh, PC or Mac? I prefer PC, but I've been using Mac for a few years just because they're better for a lot of programming things. But all else being equal, I prefer PC. Okay. McDonald's or Burger King? Uh, McDonald's. Better fries. Yeah, I agree. Much better fries. Mm -hmm. What do you go to at McDonald's then? Um, oh, gosh, I haven't been to a McDonald's. Chicken sandwiches are good. Yeah. Okay. Good choice. Coffee or tea? Coffee, lots of coffee. <laughs> Long or short? Long. Ah, uh, no, short. <laughs> to each their own. Uh, beer or wine? Um, beer usually. I I used to brew. I haven't done it in a few years just because the the 
time it takes to do it, but um, you know, wh whatever, whatever's around. Okay, <laughs> that's fair enough. Chocolate or cheese? Hmm, chocolate, but th th there's no wrong answer there. If it's dark chocolate, milk or dark? Dark. Oh. So, who cooks at home? I oh, cook, and my husband cleans cooks mostly. Yeah. I cook and he cleans, and that works great for both of us. <laughs> that sounds good. Uh, and what is your favorite food? Um, um, I'm a I'm a sucker for desserts for for chocolate peanut butter. Um, the other thing is since a, since this is a sort of light meeting week and I'm writing a lot this week, popcorn is my is my writing snack. You know, sort of can have like write a couple sentences, get a piece of popcorn, and you know, keeps me going. Uh, the, the, a, a true microscopy snack is a mm -hmm. light meal, isn't it? Mm -hmm. that's, that's such a bad joke. Sorry, I was, it was on the meeting yesterday. So someone <laughs> in the background had photon food. I had, they had a box behind their show, Sean, that said photon food. And I couldn't. <laughs> I was just itching to know if it said a light meal. I just, just. I hope so. I really hope so. Yeah, I don't mm -hmm. think it did, but they will do now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> TV or book. On vacation, I love books, but I get really mad when I have to stop reading. Um, so uh, during the week when I don't have as much time, it's usually TV. And do you get into serious in-depth programs or do you watch some trashy TV? More trashy TV than it used to be just to, to sort of wind down and relax. But, uh, you know, again, when, when I have free time, I like to watch the serious stuff too. Okay, so if you watch it, watch your trashiest tv confession what do you watch that you you are going to confess to um i'm still i don't know how i think they're like 20 seasons and now watching Grey's anatomy and uh i actually got my husband hooked on it with me and so uh that's one that we watch every week um there, again there, there's like one character left from the beginning is how many you know like assassination plots and you know very questionable sexual harassment policy decisions but uh it's good fun TV. That's so bad. And if you, when you're reading books, what genre book do you like? Um, I bounce back and forth between sort of nonfiction and sci-fi. Um, you know, I love. Uh, I recently, now I'm not going to be able to remember the guy's name on the podcast. Um, it's a very cool guy who spoke at SLAS at a, gave a keynote, and I don't remember his name, but he does books about science and something. And so he did a book about science and crime that I've been reading, and is really good. And now I'm really bummed I can't remember the name. Um, I love the Expanse series. Um, if the next Game of Thrones book ever comes out, I will definitely read it. Um, and so uh, uh, trashy TV. Could have just said Game of Thrones. Now I'm going to get loads of comments for having said that. I just, didn't say Game of Thrones were trashy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the last what? season, the last season. But uh, so you mentioned sci-fi, Star Trek or Star Wars? Serious question. Star Trek. Even though we're recording this on May 4th, so it is Star Wars Day, but um, Star Trek. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I hadn't, it is your advice. I hadn't even realized. Uh, mm -hmm. And what's your favorite film? Uh, Moulin Rouge is one that I loved in high school and is one I still find myself coming back to. Um, it's just good, silly, fun. I love music and musicals, so it's it's got that going for it, too. Yeah, I, my wife loves that film, too, and it is very good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. In Broadbent, oh, mm -hmm. awesome character in it. There's a really good uh, Fat Boy Slim version mm -hmm. of the movie mm -hmm. with uh, Jim Broadbent. Oh, it's mm -hmm. Yes. The, the the new musical version of it, like the Broadway musical, is actually pretty good. So if you get a chance, check it out. Yeah, yeah. London sells out really fast. I have to try. <laughs> uh, what's, what's your favorite Christmas film? Oh, I gotta go with classic. Go with It's a Wonderful Life. Okay, that's cool. And what sort of music do you listen to? Um, I do a lot of sort of late 90s early aughts alternative um i have terrible taste in music honestly so um i also do a lot of like musical soundtracks because again i still somewhere deep inside and that you know high school nerd who loved music and movies and just wanted to be part of it <laughs> so i think we've covered a lot of area but this is where you are today mm -hmm. where do you see yourself in five and ten years time Honestly, I kind of hope doing the same things. Like I, I've had a very weird, strange path to get to where I am, but 
Um, I love what I'm doing. I love that we're making tools that help people. I think the tools might look very different in five to 10 years. I imagine by then. Yeah, go like, how do you think they'll look in five to 10 years? How would you like them to look? Maybe that's a better answer. How would you like them to look in five to 10 years time? Um, I think there are some parts of image analysis. So segmentation is coming close to being um, a almost solved problem with neural networks. Um, it's not fully there yet, but compared to, you know, five years ago, um, you know, self pose two is so good. It is like ridiculously good. Um, uh, we had Carson Stringer over for a visit recently, and I was just totally fangirling the whole time talking with her because it's so good. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of things that right now, especially if you care about objects that you need to know in order to do a segmentation that just are about technique and not actually about biology. And I would love to sort of strip most of that out. Um, I think the tools will look very different. I hope that we're still making them and still taking what's the best of what's going on in the sort of worlds of deep learning and computer vision and bringing it to people who can then use it to answer great biological questions. Um, and I hope we're training more great computational biologists because it's it's a lot of fun and there's a desperate need for them. Like their companies are companies and universities are desperate to have these sort of tech specialists. People are desperate to become them and there's not really a bridge at the moment to sort of like make them. So I, I hope that we get to keep doing that too. And one final question. It, it's a, uh, there's a lot of news about AI. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a scaremongering maybe about AI, warnings about the dangers of AI. You know, a lot of what you're doing is based around AI, machine learning. It, it, mm -hmm. it's yeah. it, part of the same, it's mm -hmm. under the same umbrella. Do you fear that there might be a risk of a public backlash against AI that may then actually make funders be more risk averse and not, mm -hmm. not put funding in what the public are backlashing against? A bit like GM. I think GM mm -hmm. for a while got a bit, GM is now back. Mm -hmm. It had a very bad press. And if you're in the GM field, suddenly it's like, oh my goodness, funding has dropped through the floor because of public perception. Mm -hmm. Do you fear there's a risk with that around AI? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, anything humans make and humans use has a, has a possibility of going really well or really poorly. So I, I think... I think AI is is just one of that class. Um, I think that in general, the even if the the national funder, like the grant funders, stop funding this, um, the companies find it so useful. Like Google's not going to stop. Facebook's not. Or Meta now is not going to stop. Um, whether or not they're giving out grants to other people to work on stuff, but. Um, Again, I think like any human tool, there are ways that people are using it right now that are horrifying and that I can't stand. And there are ways that people are using it that make the world a better place. And uh, we just have to sort of do whatever we can to try and make sure that the people who are using it the right way win. Yeah, I, I, it'll be interesting. I, I think it's so different to how the, the chat things are one thing and that's mm -hmm. the public are getting more scared. I think using it mm -hmm. as a scientific tool mm -hmm. is a completely different objective mm -hmm. uh, in my yeah. mind. Anyway, in my mind, it's, it, it, they are you know, very, mm -hmm. very different, but but the similarities mm -hmm. are there. That, that I... mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there there was a, a paper not too long ago that um, someone was saying they were trying to train AI to make to figure out if drugs are going to be toxic so that you make fewer toxic drugs. And everybody wants that. You want, you know, cheap, more drugs and cheaper and stuff. But then they realized that oh, crap, we can't put this out. Because if you run it in reverse, you invent yeah, yeah, yeah. all sorts of chemical weapons. Um, and I was just like, oh, my gosh, I never would have thought about running it in reverse. Um, so we have to be careful. We like If we're making really powerful tools, whenever you make something really powerful, you have to think about how it could be used for harm. And even the sorts of things that, again, like it's not like a large language model, but something that's just predicting drug safety could be misused in the wrong hands. But um I think at this point, the genie's out of the bottle. Well, I, I, absolutely right, because now we know how to do it. Mm -hmm. You can use it for bad, so you might as well use it for good. Mm -hmm. And hopefully the good outweighs the bad, I guess. Ben, yeah. we, we are just over the hour. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you so much for joining mm -hmm. me today. I, I can't wait to see you. Oh, Elmi, so I will see you soon. I will be buying yeah. you a beer. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't I'll get chocolate peanut butter, but... <laughs> Who knows? It might be over there in Amsterdam or near, sorry, Netherlands. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been super cool to chat and get to know you. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, no, this has been fantastic. Just keep going with what you're doing. And I hope that in 10 years' time, you are still there, still mm-hmm. making sound profiler or the next iteration of whatever it may be mm-hmm. uh, for us all to use. And, and for all of us, everyone mm-hmm. will be benefiting mm-hmm. from as, as that develops its, its u- utilization. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the microscopists. Uh, don't forget, Best talked a lot about Anne Carpenter. You can go and listen to Anne Carpenter. Mark Raypole and Ryder, also out of Anne's lab. I think it's most people I've had out of one lab ever. Uh, but that just shows the impact and the importance of the research. And it's great to have Beth here today. You are the future for this. And it's marvellous to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists.